Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I think um, because Sweden happens to be one of the countries where my organization has a lot of members, uh, so thank you if you're one of them, um, you might be familiar with the EFF, but if not, um, we you know, started doing domestic uh, free expression work and, and litigation in the US, and now we've expanded and are now working internationally as well, although our offices are in San Francisco. Um, so my work is around freedom of expression online, and obviously uh, over the past couple of years, this has really been brought into sharp focus um, in the Arab world as well as in China, Iran, Southeast Asia. And so this has become a really big topic where a lot of governments are putting a lot of time and funding, including the Swedish government and my own government, um, into these efforts. So when we talk about threats to international freedom of expression, national threats coming from the government level, there's a whole range of different issues to focus on. And so I apologize if mine is not entirely comprehensive. Um, but I'm going to give you the brief history of what we've been looking at over the past decade or so. So um, I used to work for an organization called the Open Net Initiative, which was one of the first organizations to empirically study censorship on the internet. So in 2005, um, they conducted their first research, this was before my time, but on Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, and Bahrain, three countries that continue to be world leaders in online repression. Uh, it's an awkward sentence, but if you looked at those countries in 2004, 2005, 2006, what we saw was that many of them had actually entered the internet, had given the internet to their citizens already censored. So when Saudi Arabia came online around 2000, they had it all figured out already. They were already censoring dozens, hundreds of websites, which has now gone into the hundreds of thousands of websites. Tunisia, at the same time, was doing similar, similar things with the internet. Um, and then we started to research countries like China as well. And I'm sure everyone's familiar with China and familiar with the, the so-called Great Firewall. And so I'm actually going to focus a little bit more um, on the Middle East and North Africa, which is my specialty, but with a little bit else as well. Um, so by 2009, the research by the Open Net Initiative and by other organizations like Reporters Without Borders, Freedom House, et cetera, had found that there was heavy censorship in more than 10 countries worldwide and then mild censorship elsewhere. And so if you look at China, which restricts political speech, which restricts um, pornography, uh, socially unacceptable content, China is really kind of the world leader on this. But you've got a range of other countries too from Saudi Arabia, which tends to focus more on morality, to Russia, which is beginning to look more at uh, political speech, hate speech, and then so on and so forth. And you also have some countries that really kind of only hint at censorship. Um, a great example of this is a country that I used to live in, Morocco, where there are kind of three government red lines that you don't cross. It's the king, the, the monarchy, the Western Sahara, and the conflict there, um, and religion. You don't touch those topics. And so the censorship that existed there was only a little bit around those topics. They censored a handful of websites here, a handful there, but in large part, the internet was open. And so I'm just telling you this to give you sort of a perspective on the range of censorship that happens around the world. Um, and then we get to 2009. And I think 2009 was kind of a turning point in this. Um, you had all of these countries that were censoring, but 2009 was when we began to see surveillance become much more prevalent and much more focused. Um, we saw countries starting to implement what, what I've um, heard referred to as just-in-time filtering. Um, this happened in Iran in 2009, where around the protests uh, about the elections there, you saw the government going after certain sites for certain periods of time, but then loosening back and forward and back again. Um, and we've seen this elsewhere now as well. But 2009 was called um, the worst year ever for internet censorship. I think it was um, Alec Ross from the US State Department who said that, uh, and that's where that quote comes from. And I would agree with him, but I think that it's only gotten worse since then in a number of ways. So, again, focusing on the Middle East, I apologize, there's much, much worse in the world as well, but uh, this, again, is my specialty. Um, this is from the Open Net Initiative pre-Arab Spring, so I'm looking at research that was done in about 2009. And we looked at these different countries and on these different levels of, of censorship. And so pervasive censorship would mean a certain number of sites that were blocked across a certain number of categories, and so it was kind of, you had to have both of those things to be considered a pervasive censor of speech online. You had countries that were a little bit more selective, that only blocked a handful of sites here or there. And then countries that were deemed 
free. Now, <laughs> if you look at the countries deemed free, you'll all recognize that these are not free countries when it comes to speech, but this is what makes it so interesting because the research then was focused on the simple blocking of websites by different methods, but it was always based on, you know, you can't access this website within the country. And then as other digital rights groups and this group, you know, sort of evolved and started to look at censorship and threats to free expression more broadly, they began to realize that it wasn't just about blocking websites, which granted is incredibly problematic, but is also the easiest thing to get around. There's tons of proxy tools, there's Tor, there's all of these different methods for evading censorship, but it's much more difficult to evade these other threats, and that's what I'm getting to next. Well, after this. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, there are a number of ways that countries justify censorship, from Saudi Arabia's basis on morality, to Russia's basis on national security, and to the US, where generally threats to free expression come around intellectual property and copyright. So why do governments censor the internet? Um, obviously, you know, it's a lot of the same reasons that governments have traditionally censored the press as well, but with some nuance. And so religion and morality is one of those major categories that we see prevalent across the Muslim world, but also elsewhere. Um, it's not unique to that region. You've got national security and terrorism, which is one of the easiest ways to justify cracking down on speech. We've seen the US do this with WikiLeaks, for example. Now, US has not blocked WikiLeaks, it hasn't censored it in that traditional way, but instead has you know, kind of gone after it in different, more insidious ways, um, such as one of our senators calling on uh, PayPal and credit card companies to not process payments. You've got copyright, which um, if you saw uh, Larry Lessig's talk earlier today, um, you're familiar with this, and this is actually not my area of expertise, so hopefully you did get to see that, but copyright has been used as a justification in the US, as we saw last year with the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act, um, which, you know, you can argue that these are things that, you know, in some ways you, there is some need for protection around intellectual property, but no country has gotten this right so far. Every time there's been an attempt to protect intellectual property through um, internet regulation, it's always been too overbroad um, and has gone too far. And so in the US, we have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which in some ways works. Um, you know, if you are, let's say, uh, a music producer and you go on YouTube and you see that someone else is using your content, you can file a request with that service provider to take down the content. But this gets abused so easily. Um, and one great example of this happened during the Arab Spring, actually, where an Egyptian television station did this to censor political speech because people had remixed some of their work and were using it to explain how um, the government was cracking down. It was easy for a television channel to then go in and say, no, no, that's our content, you can't use it. And of course, nationalism is always a good excuse to censor. Um, so again, here's an example, Saudi Arabia 2005, going back a little bit. Um, if you looked at the sites that were blocked under the category of religion, this is just an example of how countries do this. So we were kind of looking at the different websites. We had this big list at the Open Net Initiative, which was something like 1,600 general sites that were tested in every country that we looked at. And then we'd create these local lists as well. And so in Saudi Arabia, under the sort of broad category of religion, this is kind of what we saw in that trajectory. We saw you know, Christian content because people are concerned about conversion, they're concerned about missionaries. We saw that kind of at the highest level. But then surprisingly, Muslim content ended up being next, and this was anything that didn't fit their very specific category of what that meant in, in Saudi Arabia. And then and so on and so forth, and it does go on beyond that. They do block atheist content, they do block other religions as well, but this was really um, where we saw the strongest level of, of censorship um, around religion. And so how do governments censor? Now, I'm not a technologist, and I imagine that a lot of you are, so I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to explain each of these. Um, but basically, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of how different countries have done this. So you can easily block a website using basic technology by URL. And this is what Syria has done um, historically. Now, there's a kind of funny anecdote here, because Syria, um, prior to 2011, again, I'm going to come to 2011, 2012 in a bit, Syria had blocked um, the popular blogging website uh, Blogger slash Blogspot. But what they did was wrong. <laughs> they well, wrong on many levels, but they did it wrong. They blocked Blogspot.com, but they didn't block Blogger.com. So what that meant was if you were a blogger using that platform, 
you could easily log in and create your blog, but then you couldn't go read it. <laughs> so people were able to get this content out of the country, and in fact, there was a pretty strong blogging culture there. Um, but then people within the country were not allowed to read it. And so that created a different sort of dynamic in how the blogosphere there um, conducted themselves. Um, you've got DNS tampering, of course, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This was very common in Tunisia. And then blocking by IP address, which can actually have a much more, um, um, uh, what am I trying to say, create much more collateral damage. And so India was a great example of this, where they were trying to block this one, I can't even remember the group, but this one um, ultra-nationalist group. And instead, by, because they blocked it by IP address, they ended up blocking a number of innocuous sites as well that had nothing to do with that at all. Um, because they were sharing the same address. And so then there's also the level of transparency with which countries conduct themselves. You've got countries that censor the internet transparently, and you might think this is a good thing. Um, I, I suppose if, if you're going to censor at all, you should at least provide justification for it. And I'll show you a, a, an example of a block page in a moment. But then you've got countries that did this not so transparently. And I think Tunisia is the best example of this, um, aside from China, of course. In Tunisia, prior to the, the Arab Spring, what would happen is you would just you would try to get to a website that was blocked, and you would end up on a 404 server error page. And so this created a whole culture around um, censorship there, where the people who were speaking out against censorship created a persona um, called Amr 404 to describe um, this, you know, to kind of personify the censorship. And so the censorship had a name. His name was Amr 404, and he was not very appreciated amongst the population. So this is what I love. Um, this is the Qatari block page. Now, kind of cute, right? They think that it's cute to censor the internet. You've got this popular Qatari cartoon. It says the site has been blocked. The web page you're trying to access has been blocked as the content contains prohibited materials. But then if you note in the bottom corner, and I'm not sure if you can read that very well, it says, if you feel this is an error, then please send an email to blah, blah, blah. So in some cases, people have actually had success in sending an email. There was one point where um, a popular news website had been kind of either temporarily blocked or accidentally blocked, and people were able to get it unblocked by sending an email to that address. But at the same time, if you send an email to that address, then you're kind of on their list at that point. And so even though they are being transparent and offering you this opportunity to unblock the website that you would like to see, um, you're also kind of sticking your neck out by doing so, and that creates a tension as well. And as I mentioned, Tunisia, this is um, one of the great cartoons that came out of, uh, um, that came out of the, the protests against censorship there. And I'm not going to get into the whole question of the Twitter Facebook revolution stuff. I'm, I know there will be a question period after the panel. But one of the things that I found so interesting about Tunisia and around the culture that happened there was that because there was so much pervasive censorship, they blocked YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, every video sharing site you can think of that when they tried, when the government tried to block Facebook a couple of years later, people actually went out into the street and protested because Facebook was the last option. And Facebook was so important, not just for personal connections or for protests, but also for professional connections and other things. And so Tunisia was never successful in blocking Facebook. And that actually contributed to the protests that ended up happening because people could use that platform to organize. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't make it a Facebook revolution, but it does provide an interesting tool for people to be able to coordinate with each other um, on civic action. Ah, so next generation controls. So I've talked a lot about censorship and this basic blocking, but we've seen countries kind of evolve in this cat and mouse game. As citizens become more active and more savvy about circumventing censorship, governments have also become more savvy as well and found different ways to repress their citizens. <coughs> Excuse me. Surveillance. Um, this picture just amazes me. I can't even believe it exists. You have Syria's president Bashar al-Assad looking over onto a computer screen as if he's watching the whole country. Um, and that's not that far from the truth, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> in 2011, February 2011, just one month before the protests in Syria started, Syria unblocked Facebook, YouTube, and some other sites. And at the time, some people were saying, oh, Oh, they must be reforming. They must have learned from the, the sort of dictator's dilemma in Tunisia and Egypt. They must have realized that censoring the internet will actually lead to more protest. I was skeptical of that argument, and it turns out that I was right, because 
it seems that their justification for unblocking those websites was not to give people more freedom, but to more easily track down citizens. And the reason for that is this. If you're using a proxy, whether it's a sophisticated proxy or tool like Tor, or just a simple web proxy, you're less likely to be detected when you're trying to go to Facebook. And even though Facebook had been censored all of those years, Syria's censorship was not that sophisticated, and so you had a lot of people in that country who were still using the website, getting around it through these proxies. So when they unblocked it, people were not necessarily thinking about security. I mean, you did have, of course, you know, the core group of activists, people who understood the importance of this, but the general population is not using Tor in any country, and they're not thinking about whether they're being tracked on Facebook. Now, at the time, Facebook did not have encryption by default. So um, assuming that there's a few non-technical folks in the audience, I'll give you a quick example on what I mean by that. Um, I assume a lot of you use online banking. And when you go to your online banking site, you see that little lock up there, that you know, HTTPS. You're going through a secure encrypted connection to access that content. Facebook did not have that. It was just HTTP. You could at some point, uh, I think sometime around the end of 2010, they rolled it out so that you could check off a little box in your settings that would allow it to be um, encrypted by default. But that wasn't the, the default setting for every user. And so in 2011, when Syria unblocked Facebook, a lot of users weren't thinking about that security issue. And then they were able to get to Facebook. And then they were able to be tracked through their use of Facebook. And what we began to see as the protests started happening there was that when an activist was arrested for participating in a demonstration or because they'd been tracked down through technological surveillance, they had their Facebook password demanded by authorities. And so then we started to see people create two Facebook pages, which, by the way, is against Facebook's terms of service, but I'll, that's, a, that's a whole other talk. Um, <laughs> and so... Um, basically, what happened was Facebook became a very unsafe way to organize in Syria, and so people started to move away from it. Um, the Syrian regime has, over the past year and a half, become more and more sophisticated in their use of surveillance technology. Um, today, there was a story in Mother Jones, a, a US magazine, that Blue Coat, an American company, finally admitted that they knew all along, even though they didn't sell it intentionally to the Syrian government, but that their tools were being used by the Syrian government for surveillance purposes um, through, I believe it was sold through a third country. And so this is troubling as well, that we've got companies, um, and I'm sure in Sweden you're familiar with uh, some of these cases, um, you've got companies in countries like the US or Sweden or France that have sold these technologies to foreign governments. And it's a tricky question because a lot of these technologies can be used for more than one purpose. You've got routers that can also be used for surveillance. You've got other things like that, um, dual use technologies. And so it is a tricky question that again is probably, you know, probably don't have time to address right now, but nonetheless. And then you've got other forms of suppression. I had meant to replace this slide, so I apologize. This one's very um, Arab region focused. I actually had this great map, um, and I'll tell you the URL if you want to check it out. There's this project called Threatened Voices. It's threatened.globalvoicesonline.org. It's a project of Global Voices, which you might be familiar with, um, which I'm on the board of, full disclosure. Um, which tracks arrests of first bloggers. When it was created, it was to track the arrests and threats to bloggers, but is now expanded to track threats, arrests, and other sorts of repression of bloggers, citizen journalists, people using Twitter, activists, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the map that's on that website, really sorry that I don't have it in my slides, um, you'll see that some countries have these big circles with a huge number in them of the number of people they've arrested over the years. Um, and granted, this website is not comprehensive. We're a volunteer-based organization, so it's, it's difficult to track every case. But I think we've got, you know, right now, some 200 or so bloggers around the world that are in prison. That's a pretty big number, considering that blogging is a phenomenon that started less than 10 years ago. Um, and of course, the countries that lead in this respect, China, Iran, Syria, Vietnam, lots of the usual suspects. But you'll also find isolated cases here and there in Western democracies. Um, these are three examples. Um, you might be familiar with Hazana Hazawi. Um, she is a Syrian blogger who was arrested um, twice last year, um, was working for a free expression organization in her country, uh, and you know, suffered a lot through this. Um, the second one is Ali Abdul Imam, a Bahraini blogger who uh, was sentenced to, I hope I get this right, I think 18 years in prison for blogging 
for having a, an online platform. Um, he was sentenced in absentia, and right now he's still missing or in hiding. We don't know exactly. Um, and then another Syrian blogger, Hussein Khair, who is still in prison in Syria. And there are numerous other examples from all over the world. Again, I apologize, this is a very specific regional slide. But... And then state propaganda, another example. Um, this is just one website that I, I've used as an example because it's kind of interesting. Um, it cropped up last year, and some of my friends' names were on it, and I thought, gosh, that's weird. And basically, it was trying to expose um, activists who are either Syrian or pro-opposition in Syria um, for their role, their plot against the Syrian government as if they were terrorists and not activists. Um, and this has happened in a number of other countries as well. You may have heard of China's 50 Cent Army, where um, people are allegedly paid by the government to comment on, on platforms or to report on others. Um, we've seen this as well um, from Syria, of course. In Bahrain, it's been a really big issue where um, you might be familiar with the New York Times journalist Nicholas Kristof. When he was reporting from Bahrain, he was tweeting his articles out, and he's very active on Twitter. And what we saw was that he was getting death threats in response from people on Twitter. And I, I started looking at the names and looking at the people, and a lot of them had Western names but said that they were in Bahrain. I was like, that's kind of strange. Why would all of these Americans or, or Westerners living in Bahrain be threatening Nicholas Kristof? And it seems that they were not, in fact, who they said they were at all. They were either paid or um, just pro-government commenters who had sort of created these different personas to try to make it look as though Bahrain's opposition was actually a terrorist organization. And then, of course, other tactics. Um, I mentioned earlier just-in-time censorship. The best example of this, of course, is in Iran in 2009. Um, actually, maybe not even the best example. I think the best one, of course, is when Egypt shut down the internet for seven days, um, with one exception, one small ISP remained up. And that was the sort of case where my guess is if I were Mubarak, I would have been thinking, hmm, well, all these activists, they're all using the internet to organize with each other. I'm just going to cut them off. Well, it didn't work very well, did it? Um, you've also got net so network shutdowns, that's my second example. Coercion of private companies, and I don't just mean companies selling surveillance technology to foreign governments, but also companies pressuring um, platforms like Facebook to take down content. We've seen this a lot, for example, with Pakistan. Um, my favorite example, and I would have shown the video, but I, I didn't have time to put it together, uh, there was this video that... <laughs> I think it was the president of Pakistan, um, who had said he was giving a speech and there were some raucous people in the front and he said, shut up, <laughs> really in English, said shut up, and demanded that this video be censored. Somebody captured it on video, of course, put it up on YouTube in five minutes, and tried, the government tried to pressure YouTube to take that down. We've also seen this with blasphemy charges, of course. Um, I will mention briefly that there are a lot of efforts, um, particularly in that arena, to fight back. One of them is the Global Network Initiative, which my organization is a part of. And I'm seeing more and more of these different initiatives cropping up. And frankly, um, you know, I, I don't have a, a real preference toward one or the other. I think that we need a broader landscape of looking at these companies and making them aware of the implications of what they're doing. Um, and for me, I think that this goes beyond government threats, but also to the types of terms of service that companies enact to regulate speech on the internet. Uh, because when we, when we go online, a lot of times we think of Facebook or Twitter as the public sphere. It's like going into the town square and carrying a banner, but it's not because it's privately owned. Um, and so I think that's something that we're seeing companies think more about, but I think that they all have a very long way to go before they get it right. Um, and then, of course, bad regulation, which is really, frankly, um, kind of the domain of my country in some ways, um, but is also happening all over the world. Um, regulation created by people who seem to not really understand how the internet works. Um, and, you know, the US, I'm, again, SOPA and PIPA last year. Um, but another example that came up recently, and I was very proud of the way this was defeated, um, no, I don't have the slide, um, was in Lebanon. There was this act called the Lebanese Internet, Internet Regulation Act, or Lira, which is funny because the Lebanese currency is also the Lira, but I digress. Um, and this act, actually, one of, the, one of the key parts of it said something about um, people only allowed to have one website. So as a citizen, you can only have one website. And the activists were thinking, okay, well, 
does that in include Twitter? Does that mean that I, can, I have to choose between Twitter and Facebook, or Twitter and a blog, or Facebook and a blog, or all three? Um, and so it was one of those absurd acts, and luckily activists were able to get one step ahead of the government and shoot it down pretty quickly. But like Medusa, all of these things come back and often come back worse, and so it's a constant cat and mouse game. We're seeing similar really bad regulation in Iraq right now. And in the Philippines, um, a great example, the Cybercrime Act, which just came up there, um, one of the things that it bans, which is slightly funny, but also kind of terrifying because of the vague wording of it, is cyber sex. Um, another thing, of course, is criminal defamation, and that's a huge issue. Um, Philippines, you know, obviously has this history where defamation was part of martial law, and there are all these issues around it. And so to see that come back in this form where, you know, you can't make anonymous comments on the internet now in the Philippines because you're under threat of defamation charges, that's terrifying. Another example is Thailand, where Thailand has these Les Majestés laws where you can't criticize the royal family. And as I told a reporter earlier today, now, if you're a citizen of Thailand, you know about that law. That law has been a part of your life. You, you grew up with it. And so if you choose to criticize the royal family, you're making a decision to do that. But what's been so dangerous about this, and I'm not saying that that's okay, I'm just saying you're, you're aware of it. But what's been so dangerous about, about this law is there was a case last year where um, a, a, an operator of a, a very popular website in Thailand was actually um, put on trial because her website had comments from outside people criticizing the government. And so that was an, a, an issue of intermediary liability, where she wasn't the one making the speech, she was just the one hosting it. Um, and that case, luckily, I think she was um, acquitted or given, I, I don't recall exactly, I'm sorry, but um, that case would have had serious implications for um, big companies like Facebook or Google as well, because they're also intermediaries that host speech. We're seeing that right now in India as well, in a number of other countries. So 2012, bringing us to now, what is the state of threats, national threats to freedom of expression? Well, so censorship in some ways is becoming more transparent. This is an example from Tunisia where um, the, the Tunisian Internet Agency, which under the Ben Ali regime was the one that surveilled you and, and censored you, has now become kind of this very different, very differently uh, created sort of differently framed organization. Um, and the head of that agency, Moaz Chakshok, he's amazing, I have to say. Um, if anyone's going to the IGF, try to meet him there because he's wonderful. He has been fighting actively um, through the courts and through rhetoric against censoring the internet again. He has said publicly, I wouldn't even censor the internet in my home and I have young children. And so to have somebody leading a, a, an internet agency like that is, to me, a very impressive thing. But what happened almost immediately after um, the revolution in Tunisia was the censorship was taken away, but then the military tried to bring it back. And so this was an example from, I think, May 2011. Um, I have to walk a little bit closer so I can read it. But basically, these were um, ordered by the tribunal, the military tribunal of Tunis. Um, and you've got what you've got there is four Facebook pages, and then the one that's circled in red, it says um, basically addresses of pornographic sites filtered by smart filter. And so they decided that they would call out the company that had sold their government in the previous era the tools to do the censorship. And what I found out from Mr. Shakshuk was that smart filter, an American company that's now owned by Intel, but at the time was McAfee, I think, um, had actually offered a discount to the Tunisian government in order to test, to bug test their software there. And so they said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll give you this software free or almost free, and, and you give us feedback on how it works. And so that had enabled this pervasive censorship to occur. And so he was saying at the time that he didn't want to renew that contract, but was under all sorts of government pressure to do so. Um, as the state in Tunisia right now is that these sites, uh, the pornographic sites, are, are censored in, in schools and public buildings, but not for the whole internet, and they're hoping to keep it that way. Um, blasphemy, obviously, if you've not been living under a rock for the past two months, you've seen this come up. Um, this video that happened recently, this, this slide is actually much older, but uh, the video that happened a couple months ago created by um, an Egyptian copt in California that um, was very insulting to the Muslim prophet, um, that created this whole slew of issues on censorship. And what was interesting about that was you had three different ways that governments went after this video. You had governments that did the right thing, and by right I mean the 
legal procedure. They got a court order, they took the court order to Google, which owns YouTube, and said, block this in my country. And Google complied in most of those cases. So that was uh, Malaysia, um, Saudi Arabia, a few other countries. Then you had governments that said, we're just going to block YouTube completely. This is a horrible website. We don't want our youth and our, our people seeing this. Afghanistan's a good example of that. And then you had a couple of countries where Google decided to make an executive decision to censor for that country, even though no one had asked them to do so. And this was Libya and Egypt. Now, Libya has relatively low internet penetration, and I'm honestly not really that closely in touch with activists there, so I didn't hear much reaction. But in Egypt, there were a couple of civil liberties organizations that were furious. How dare Google come in after we have fought so hard for our free expression rights, and, and are still fighting, of course, and decide for us what we can see. And that was kind of the rhetoric that was coming out of um, the Arabic Network for Human Rights Information and some other organizations. Um, but these blasphemy cases continue in Egypt, and most of them have been directed in fact, almost all of them have been directed at Christians and atheists. Um, and this was a, a case from last year, I think May, I think that was May 2011, where in Kuwait, um, the members of parliament tried to okay the death penalty for blasphemy. Um, that did not pass, but it's still, they're still trying to. Bad regulation. I talked about this one earlier, but this is just a great slide. I love to collect these, these um, different activist movements, and I love to see how people are opposing censorship. And so this is one from Lebanon. But one of the other really fun things that I've seen, I'll try to end this a little bit on a positive note. One of the great things I've seen um, coming from all over the world is, if you recall last year when SOPA and PIPA happened in the US, what activists did was blacked out websites, and that was a great tactic. It, it you know, created a, a higher degree of awareness among people who are not really following these issues, um, and it really managed to garner enough support to kill those two bills, at least for now. Um, we've now seen at least three other countries do that same tactic. They did it in the Philippines, they did it in Jordan, and I'm not gonna remember the third one, um, but these were, cases where they saw, and, and I don't mean to say the US is teaching everyone else. In fact, I think that Tunisia, m many of the amazing anti-censorship techniques and tactics have come from Tunisian activists who dealt with this for so many years. But in this case, it was something that had been grassroots in the US um, that some companies had signed on to, and then that tactic spread to other governments, or um, sorry, other countries and other activist groups. And I love seeing that sort of thing, um, how we're kind of building this global culture of opposing censorship. And so, I'll end it on this note. What can you do? Um, if this is something that interests you, I mean, I think, you know, obviously, yes, you can support the EFF. That's great. You can support other organizations that do similar work. I don't know exactly who's doing that in Sweden, but, you know, there's a whole range of groups that you can support. It's not about me or my organization. Um, but you can support technology and advocacy efforts. There are a lot of ways where you can, you can donate to groups like Tor that are building anonymity and circumvention tools. Um, you, if you're a technologist, work on building new tools, find new solutions. Um, naming and shaming companies, and you know there have been a lot of regulatory efforts in Europe. They're trying in the U.S. It's not working very well there um, to to enact legislation that would block companies from selling surveillance or censorship technology to repressive regimes. But if all else fails, call them out on it. And that's what a lot of journalists, I think Bloomberg in particular, oddly enough, um, has been doing an amazing job of of calling out these different companies for their their repressive uh, support. Amplifying local efforts, that's something that's really important to me. I don't like to, as an American, I can't really walk into another country and tell people how to do it, <laughs> how, to, how to oppose censorship. Um, and so what I try to do is keep an ear to the ground and listen to what local activists are doing and offer them my support if I can, and of course spread the word. Um, I think, I think I'm close to time, I'm not quite sure, um, but this is me, uh, again, Electronic Frontier Foundation, that's me on Twitter, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of, so if you do have any questions that we don't have time for, um, you're more than welcome to send me a note, um, and I'm always happy to, to chat, so thank you. <laughs>